welcome you all tonight to the 1990 Samuel and Althea Strom Lectureship in Jewish Studies. My name is Hillel Kival, and I'm chairman of the Jewish Studies program here at the university. Before I begin, let me um, make an announcement. And that announcement is to invite everyone here to a reception in honor of our speaker, Michael Fishbane, across the hall at the Walker Ames Room, immediately following tonight's lecture, the reception generously hosted by Samuel and Althea Strong. So that's tonight, immediately after the lecture. And this means that it's worth your while to plan your evening strategically so that you make sure to stay to the end so that you can enjoy the coffee and dessert which will follow. As I mentioned, on behalf of the Jackson School of International Studies and the Jewish Studies program uh, at the university, welcome to what is now, in fact, the 15th annual Samuel and Althea Strom Lectureship in Jewish Studies, a series which began back in 1976 uh, and which has brought to campus um, such distinguished scholars in various fields of Jewish scholarship as Yehuda Bauer, Irving Howe, Yosef Yerushalmi, Yosef Don, the writer Aharon Appelfeld, Robert Alter, Ruth Weiss, and last year, Michael Meyer. I think that we now uh, can rightly claim the um, distinction of having not only a distinguished, but now even an old lecture series, and long may it continue. This year's lecturer is Michael Fishbane, who is the Samuel Lane Professor of Jewish Religious History and Social Ethics at Brandeis University. And for me, it's a tremendous pleasure, and it's also somewhat difficult to be able to introduce Michael Fishbane, uh, whom I consider to be both a teacher and a friend. And um, it's a, particularly a pleasure because in the three years that I myself taught at Brandeis, the, the, the moments of greatest intellectual pleasure and comfort, in a sense, were those quiet moments that we had together to discuss his work and my work, the academic field in general, and a good dose of Brandeis academic gossip. It was really, I think, uh, one of the most fulfilling aspects of my own brief stay there. Michael Fishbane, who is the author of four major books and over 40 articles, uh, is, among other things, but I stress this, among other things, one of the leading biblical scholars in the world today, and one of the leading interpreters of the Hebrew Bible. He has published Biblical Interpretation in Ancient Israel in 1985, uh, of which I'll speak some more later. Text and Texture, Studies in Biblical Literature, Judaism, Traditions, Revelation and Traditions, and most recently, this book, The Garments of Torah, published by Indiana University Press, which consists of uh, collected essays in interpretations of the Bible and its literature. A biblical... Um, scholar and critic, but many other things as well. His 1985 opus, for example, Biblical Interpretation in Ancient Israel, was a pathbreaking work which had an enormous impact on a number of different fields of study. And uh, evidence of this is the fact that it won awards in at least three different categories from three different American institutions. First of all, it won the 1986 National Jewish Book Award in scholarship. And then the Kenneth B. Smilin Literary Award in Jewish Religious Thought. And lastly, the Biblical Archaeology Award in Old Testament. The book demonstrated, among other things, that the Bible was never what you might call a closed system. There has never been, and perhaps can never be, a formal distinction between the sacred text on the one hand and interpretation of that text. So you might say on one level that um, text and exegesis 
go hand in hand. But Professor Fishbane went beyond this simple statement to show just how ancient the tradition of textual interpretation is in Judaism. He did this by uncovering layers of exegesis within the biblical text itself. And one of the important conclusions that I think that is to be drawn from this type of work is that in a scriptural tradition like Judaism, the text, which forms the core of the tradition, can never be fully separated from processes of transmission and interpretation. The sacred texts themselves are often reflections on earlier materials. Sometimes they're even contemplations of themselves. And then these texts served as the basis for subsequent transmissions, evaluations, and transmutations of tradition. And it's this process of reading, understanding, and transmission of which whatever is creative, whatever is original in Judaism consists, perhaps in any revealed tradition. Michael Fishbane's concern has never been that thus solely with the Bible as a literary document, but rather with what uh, I might call the religious experience that is encoded within its words, its promise of inspiration for the reader, for example. And thus he writes in his most recent book, The Garments of Torah, the following. The well-known Talmudic image of God studying and interpreting his own Torah is nothing if not that tradition's realization that there is no authoritative teaching which is not also the source of its own renewal, that revealed teachings are a dead letter unless revitalized in the mouth of those who study them. Tonight, um, Professor Fishbane is going to begin a series of lectures on what is for him a new endeavor in the, um, the role of uh, exegesis and uh, the transmission of religious ideas in Judaism. It's entitled, The Kiss of God, Spiritual Death in Jewish Religious History. Tonight's lecture, or shall I begin with Thursday night's? Thursday night's lecture, April 26th, is entitled, The Martyr and the Mystic, subtitled, For Love is as Strong as Death. That will be at 8 p.m. here at Kane Hall. Then Monday night, uh, April 30th, at 8 p.m. next door in Kane 220, it's entitled Practicing Death, Rituals of Prayer and Sanctification. Tonight's lecture is entitled If You Wish to Live, Then Die, Paths of Ascent to God in Jewish Spirituality. Professor Fishbane. Thank you very much, Hillel. Um, firstly, let me express my warm personal thanks to Hillel Kival and the Jewish Studies Committee at the university for the invitation to speak with you and for their very warm hospitality. My thanks are also to the Strom family for their support of a serious lecture series in Jewish Studies, which broadens the scope of Jewish knowledge both here at the university and for the community at large. The topic I've chosen is the kiss of God, an old rabbinic theme that originally dealt with the death of Moses, but became a major motif in the Middle Ages and focused specifically on the love of God. I think we're getting some feedback. Strangely, Though this theme of the kiss of God was treated quite a bit in early rabbinic literature, the subject in all of its ramifications, in the medieval philosophical literature, in the mystical literature, as it affects martyrdom and also everyday ritual has not been treated. So I ask you to join me in embarking on this important theme, which will teach us a great deal about Judaism, and Jewish spirituality, and along the way, a variety of techniques of medieval Jewish meditation. Thus, while my apparent topic deals with death, 
as you will see, the real theme is the love of God, a love that is consummated in death and consumed by a longing for death. Just what this means, we shall soon see. By way of introduction, let me say a few words about the Song of Songs, whose language is basic to our theme tonight and throughout the week. In the great love song of the Hebrew Bible, Solomon's Song of Songs, the female beloved has the first word. Yishakeni minishikot pihu, she cries to her friends. Let, me kiss, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And then in a private reverie, she speaks to the lover in her heart and says, for your love is sweeter than wine. With these words, the maiden confesses the hope of love and its paradoxes. She stands simultaneously in the readiness of erotic consummation symbolized here by the kiss, and in the assertion that this rapture exceeds all earthly delights, symbolized by wine, that old elixir of desire. There is little doubt that these ancient lyrics arise from human passions and reflect the desires and dialogues of earthly eros. But perhaps for just this reason, these concrete figures of desire were transformed by the religious imagination. Thus, from an early time, Solomon's song was read by the rabbis as an allegory of Israel's historical relationship with God. And the opening words, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, were understood as the nation's expectation of revelation at Sinai. To be sure, this allegorical reading retains the dialogical aspect of the original. And even through the symbolism of the kiss, eroticizes the revelation itself. But the allegory focuses on Israelite history, and the kiss is a one-time legal moment. It remained for the Zohar in the 13th century to spiritualize the allegory and divinize the love. Let us hear Rabbi Isaac explaining the words, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. He said, it is, this refers to the community of Israel who says this to God. And why does she say, let him kiss me instead of let him love me? Because as we have been taught, kissing expresses the cleaving of spirit to spirit. Therefore, the mouth is the medium of kissing, for it is the organ of the spirit and breath. Hence, he who dies by the kiss of God is united with another spirit with the divine spirit which never separates from him. Therefore the community of Israel prays, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, that his spirit may be united with mine and never separate from it. In this interpretation, where the beloved is the community of Israel and the lover is God, desire has been transformed. The hope of Israel is not for God's Torah, but for spiritual bliss. The maiden's hope has become the people's yearning for unio mystica, for a mystical cleaving with God. In the process, the theme of death, of death by the kiss of God, is invoked. This old imagery heightens the paradoxical relations between love and death in the spiritual life. For at the highest point of rapture, there is a kind of death, a unification of the human spirit with the pure spirit of God. To be sure in the Zohar, this unity is between God and all Israel. It remained for Maimonides and his disciple, Rabbi Joseph Ibn Aknin, in subsequent decades of the 13th century to read Solomon's song in more personal terms. For them, the beloved is the individual human soul that yearns for God striving for contact through a lifetime of philosophical training and religious commandments. But even then, the goal may be reached only at physical death, for only then might the human soul flee the shackles of matter and unite with God. Such is the ideal of a perfected life, the release of the soul to God at death. But there is another aspect to this ideal, the ideal of what we may call a supernatural death. 
When the human soul leaves the body and ascends momentarily to the realms of eternity, it will be the special concern of tonight's lecture to focus on various modalities of such a spiritual death or the desire for such a death in Jewish religious sources. In some cases, the language remains philosophical, though new experiences also produce more mystical modes of expression. They provide a clear glimpse of the important and pervasive religious theme of loving God in Judaism, even unto death. So let us begin and turn to a most remarkable expression of our subject. It is a prayer by Rabbi Yehuda Halevi entitled, Adonai Kol Ta'avati Elecha, Lord, all my longing is for you. Lord, all my longing is before you, even though it does not pass my lips. Grant me your favor for even a moment, and I will die. If only you would grant my wish, I will commit my spirit into your keeping. I will sleep, and my sleep will be pleasant. When I am far from you, my life is death. But if I cling to you, my death is life. But I do not know what to offer you, what my service and my worship should be. In the opening stanza, Halevi articulates the paradoxes of religious desire. His only great longing, he says, is to be blessed with God's favor. And were this granted, there would be nothing to live for. Death itself would be the fitting finale. But what kind of death? Does Halevi mean a physical or a mystical death? It is hard to say for sure. This ambiguity clears up in the next lines when he says that his distance from God is a living death, whereas in cleaving to God, his death is life. From these words, it would seem that Halevi's hope is for a spiritual rapture in life, that is, for a death to false desires and a birth into true life. In any case, it is clear that Halevi has given us a passionate Jewish version of an old philosophical theme. It is one that derives from Plato, in fact, as we can confirm from the following lines found in the Phaedo. The philosopher de desires death. What is the nature of that death which he desires? Death is the separation of soul and body and the philosopher desires such a separation. He would like to be freed from the domination of the bodily pleasures of the senses, which are always perturbing his mental vision. All the evils and impurities and necessities of men come from the body. Why then should he repine when the hour of separation arises? Why, if he is dead while he lives, should he fear that other death, through which alone he can behold wisdom in her purity. As we have seen, Halevi speaks also of desire, and a desire for death, and knows that so long as he remains a slave to his passions, he is dead while alive. He therefore desires an ecstatic release from the body, a death in rapture as the culmination of his spiritual quest. On rare occasions, such a death may be achieved as a peak experience within life, though the commoner ideal is the release of the soul at physical death. In any case, this cannot be compared to the natural death of all mortals, which is merely the degeneration of matter. The pagan philosopher Porphyry succinctly made the point long ago. Death is twofold, he said, one known by all when body is loosed from soul, the other of the philosophers where the soul is loosed from the body. Our theme of religious death is thus deeply entwined with the eros of the soul and draws upon the difference between matter and spirit. By medieval times, this ideal was a commonplace in Jewish religious thought. I stress this point because it goes against the popular modern notion that life and death are absolute polarities in Judaism and that Judaism does not abase matter or have a strong matter-spirit dualism. 
Such platitudes have some basis in the Hebrew Bible, to be sure. But the currents of Hellenism run deep and influence Judaism at very early formative stages. One must therefore be very wary of thinking that there is some older pure Judaism that can easily be distilled from the brew of Greek thought. Our present topic is a case in point. Let the following example stand for a hundred witnesses. In the Babylonian Talmud, in Tamid, Alexander the Great is said to have asked the Jewish scholars of the South the following question. What should a man do in order to live? And the rabbis reportedly answered, he should mortify himself, literally kill himself. Whereupon Alexander asks further, and what should a man do in order to die? To which question the Jewish sages replied, he should vivify himself, that is, he should indulge in bodily desires. Quite clearly, the ancient rabbis have got their Plato straight, and no one should imagine that they are merely putting on a show for the great Alexander. To the contrary, they speak epigrammatically as native wise men, and if there is any irony, it is rather that the disciples of Moses tutor Alexander in the ways of Greek philosophical virtue. Deny your body ple bodily pleasures, they counsel, if you desire true life. Nor is this an isolated Jewish remark. It is also found in an old rabbinic ethical treat tractate called Derech Eretz, and goes, if it be thy will not to die, die before you die. Mut ad shelo tamut. This formula is striking. It is echoed in the later Sufi saying, mutu kabla an tamutu, as well as in the prayer of Saint John of the Cross. Vivo sin vivir en mi, y de tal manera espero, que muero porque no muero. I live without living in myself, and by such a way, hope that I die before I die. In their language of desire and death, St. John and Rabbi Yehuda Halevi were spiritual kinsmen. We have thus hit upon an important theme of Jewish spirituality. As a mode of love of God, it repays further exploration. Its focus, its focus is on a mode of ascetic piety which sets itself against this worldly desires, precisely because these desires stimulate the lower self and turn one away from God and spiritual deliverance. In the intellectual version of this teaching, which draws upon Plato's soul-body dualism, there is a kind of self-liberation through a strengthening of the intellect and its attachment to God. This point is made with exegetical sharpness by the earliest Jewish Neoplatonic philosopher, Isaac Israeli. In his ninth century work, The Book of Definitions, he provides the following quotation and commentary. Plato said that philosophy is a zeal, a striving and concern for death, says Isaac. This is a description of great profundity and elevated meaning. For in saying concern for death, the sage meant it to be understood in the sense of the killing of beastly desires and lusts. For in their mortification and avoidance is the highest rank, the supernal splendor and the entry into the realms of truth. And by vivifying beastly desires and lusts, and by strengthening them, men of intellect are drawn away from that which is due to God in the way of obedience, purity, and attention to prayer at the prescribed hours. You will surely have noticed here the same vocabulary, concerns, and contrasts which are found in the teaching of the Jewish scholars of the South. So that if Israeli has not harnessed a Hellenized Jewish teaching to a Platonic instruction, he demonstrates a Platonizing comment by a Jew. It is important to note here that for Israeli, self-liberation is not solely through knowledge, even though he knows and cites the dictum that philosophy is man's knowledge of himself. As a Jew, the themes of obedience, purity, and attention to prayer at the prescribed times are of central concern. 
In Israeli's view, and it was the view followed by other medieval Jewish philosophers as well, the patterns of religious piety guided one upon the ascetic path whose ultimate aim was the intellectual love of God. Philosophical asceticism demanded that one kill one's earthly nature. This was the narrow gate into the realm of truth. Maimonides continues this philosophical tradition. He too makes it very clear that halachic or legal practice is the divinely given means whereby one's soul may be attached to God in this world and permanently joined to the active intellect upon death. The desires of material existence are thus controlled by ritual piety and diminished by philosophical knowledge. In a sense, there is in Maimonides' doctrine a kind of idealism by which you are or become what you think about, so that to be intellectually focused on God at all times is progressively to strengthen the link between the human intellect and its divine source. But such a linkage can never be complete so long as the soul remains in the body, and the merest trace of matter taints it with an earthly hue. To be perfected, one must love God passionately, with an undivided spiritual attention throughout life. The climax for Maimonides is death, death by a divine kiss. This is how he describes it in a famous passage near the end of the Guide of the Perplexed. In the measure in which the faculties of the body are weakened and the fire of the desire is quenched, the intellect is strengthened, its apprehension is purified, and it rejoices in what it apprehends. The result is that when a perfect man is stricken with years and approaches death, this apprehension increases very powerfully. Joy over this apprehension and a great love for the object of apprehension becomes stronger until the soul is separated from the body at that moment in this state of pleasure. Because of this, the sages have indicated with reference to the deaths of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam that the three of them died by a kiss. They said that the dictum, and Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab in the mouth, by the mouth of the Lord from Deuteronomy, indicate that he died by a kiss. Similarly, it is said of Aaron, by the mouth of God, he died there. And they said of Miriam in the same way, quote, she also died by a kiss. But with regard to her, it is not said by the mouth of the Lord, because she was a woman. The use of the figurative expression, therefore, was not suitable with regard to her. Their purpose was to indicate that the three of them died in the pleasure of this apprehension, due to the intensity of passionate love. In this dictum, the sages, may their memory be blessed, followed, this, followed, the, sage, uh, excuse me, followed the generally accepted poetical way of expression that calls the apprehension that is achieved in a state of intense and passionate love, for him may it be exalted a kiss. In accordance with the dictum, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. After having reached this condition of enduring permanence, that intellect remains in one and the same state, the impediment that sometimes screens him off from God being removed. And he will remain permanently in that state of intense pleasure, which does not belong to all bodily pleasure, as we have explained in our complications and others have explained before us. In this remarkable discussion, Maimonides interprets an interpretation of scripture in terms of a mystical death in rapture. The sequence is the following. The old rabbinic sages read the accounts of the death of Moses and Aaron by God's mouth, al pi Hashem, quite literally. For them, this expression does not simply refer to death by divine direction, but death literally by the kiss of God. The righteous die peacefully, they taught, and their souls are withdrawn from their bodies as painlessly as a hair is removed from milk. Maimonides reinterpreted this to be death in rapture, a death in the pleasure of intellectual apprehension due to the intensity of passionate love. The kiss is thus a poetical way of talking about the consummation of spiritual eros as the death of the earthly self. But let us be sure that we follow Maimonides the whole way 
and notice the double design of his words. Most manifestly, he asserts that with the weakening of human passions and the intensification of single-minded attachment to God, the self may die at God's will and thereby transcend death forever. But we may also realize that Maimonides has also subtly woven into his account an indication of a divine rapture while still alive. For the perfected soul so blessed, there is a permanent attachment to God. Such a person may return to this world and go about his tasks, but his mind will be fixed upon God forever. This state, the rapture of the human intellect by the active intellect, is thus the finalization of the intense love and mindfulness of the person who places God before himself always, as the psalm says. It may be because this high level of intellectual achievement is also the level of prophecy that Maimonides has obscured his formulation. The possibility of a state of spiritual death while still alive is stated more clearly by Rabbi Menachem Rekhanati in the 15th century. In his mystical commentary on the Torah, Rekhanati teaches that the patriarch Jacob also died by the kiss of God, engaged in the supernal mysteries with his imaginative faculty focused on things which appeared engraved before him. The ancient sage Ben Azai, a contemporary of Rabbi Akiba, died a similar death, says Rekhanati, when his soul adhered to the superior soul and tremendous things were engraved in his heart and he imagined them. During this act of cleaving to God, the mystic draws down the heavenly influx. This was the manner of the prophets as well, who in accordance with their attachments could know the future. Rekhanati thus concludes that when the soul so comprehends the superior soul and is so bound to it, the terrestrial garment falls away. And this, he says, is death by a kiss. An episode of such a death by divine kiss is then cited from the Zohar. The image of spiritual rapture mentioned there is that of a drunk or inebriated soul, an ancient figure of mystical bliss already known to Philo 1,000 years earlier. The 13th century thus knows two distinct types of death by a kiss. One, the intellectual rapture described by Maimonides, and two, the ecstatic death of the mystical companions described in the Zohar. Rikanati's commentary clearly continues the philosophical vocabulary reflected in Maimonides, both in his account of the death of Jacob and his comment of the earlier tradition from the Zohar. But with his reference to the imaginative engravings envisioned by the mystics, Rekhanati points to a third type of tradition of death by divine kiss in the 13th century. I'm referring to the work of Rabbi Isaac of Akko, the great disciple of Nachmanides. In his own mystical commentary on the Torah, the Meirat Enayim, Rabbi Isaac not only interprets the phrase to cleave to him, Lidav Kabo, as meaning to cleave to the tetragram, the four-letter divine name, imaginatively written before him, but goes on to say that in accordance with his mystical knowledge will be the cleaving of his thought, and in accordance with the cleaving of him will be the exaltation of his soul in the world to come until it departs from his body by a kiss and returns to its source. What is particularly important here is that by virtue of a meditational focus on the divine name in his mind, one is led to a mystical death. And so we have a further link in a chain of tradition of ecstatic Kabbalah that intensified at this time. Rabbi Abraham Abu Lafia was a major figure of this development, which combined the philosophical vocabulary of Maimonides with meditational techniques focused on the holy divine names. By contrast with Maimonides' concern for halakha, or legal practice, as the highway to perfection, and his great effort to pre present this public way through his legal code, Rabbi Abraham Abu Lafia and Rabbi Isaac of Akko were concerned with a higher way, 
spiritual perfection through meditation in isolation. This was a way of esoteric teachings and practices. It was not exoteric or public as the halakha. The remarkable rabbinic tradi tradition of the scholars of the South, which we discussed earlier in connection with Isaac Israeli, recurs in the mystic writings of Abu Lafia. Thus, in his Sefer Hamelitz, he says, he who wishes to die in the coming world shall live in this one. And he who wishes to die in this world will live in the next. And the principle of it is that in killing the evil impulse, he will make his good impulse to live. And if he kills his good impulse, he makes his evil impulse to live. But this is not the whole story. To kill one's evil nature is merely preparatory to achieving a higher level of consciousness. And this can be achieved only through seclusion and highly refined techniques of manipulating the holy names of God. As a result of the permutation of letters and the visions that accompany them, one may hope to ascend beyond the body to a higher mystical knowledge. In his work, Chaye HaOlam Haba, he puts it this way. The more sublime intellective flow is strengthened within you, the more your external and internal organs become weakened, and your body begins to tremble greatly and mightily until you think that you shall surely die at the time, for your soul will become separated from your body out of the great joy in retaining and knowing what you have known. What Abu Lafi receives, of course, is the influx of prophetic knowledge, knowledge from beyond this world. In this heavenly ascension of a soul to its heavenly source, there is something of a shamanistic journey, an out-of-the-body experience, so to speak. This is an old tradition, one recorded in the Heichalot Rabati, an early rabbinic collection documenting the flight of the soul throughout the heavenly palaces in order to behold the divine glory and learn the secrets of history. The image is also known from such old books as Third Enoch and the Ascension of Isaiah. In these texts, the visionary dies in the midst of a rapturous vision, which he later relates upon return and resuscitation. The Abu Lafian journey is the release of the soul and its attainment of knowledge. A most striking account of this is found in the 10th chapter of A Tract on Ecstasy written by Yehuda Al-Botini, a spiritual disciple of Abu Lafia, who lived in Safed and Jerusalem in the 15th and 16th century. In the Sulam Ha'aliyah, Al-Botini describes complex meditative practices. It begins with physical seclusion and various other conditions, and continues with an account of how to perform the letter combinations that lead to a loosening of the knots of knowledge so that the soul can transcend earthly syntax. The permutations are accompanied with various vocalizations, and these are performed with various types of aspiration and head movements. Gradually, through single-minded cleaving to God as a name, in these, in these mantras, the devotee enters a state of ecstasy. His corporeal powers are annihilated, and his intellect transformed. He becomes part of what he thinks, the divine being. Here is Albotini's account. He will fall to the earth almost as if dead, kimat kimomet, and he, will sleep, and he will be down and fall into a deep trance. Then, if he is worthy, his creator will release a spirit from heaven upon him and make known to him his questions. At that time, his soul is made simple and enjoys communion, hitab kut, with the root of the source from which he was hewn. It can even happen that his soul, at this occasion of its simplification from all things, will be separated from the body, and the ecstatic will remain dead, mate. And a death like this is exalted, for it is like the death by a kiss. In this way, the soul of Ben Azai, who saw and died, was separated because his soul rejoiced in seeing the source from which it was hewn. 
It wanted to commune, lihitabe, with it and to remain there and thus not return to the body. Of this death it is said, quoting Psalm 116, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his pious ones, chasidav. We can see here that at the height of ecstasy, two stages are involved. The first is communion with a heavenly angel who answers questions. This tradition preceded our Bottini by many centuries, for we have several 13th century accounts of sages who received answers to various matters while in a dead trance. Those who saw the mystical stupor of Michael the angel said that he appeared to be dead. This state is presumably something like the catatonic state of the prophet Ezekiel. At any rate, in this insensate condition, the adept is apparently of a split consciousness. For though in a high state of ecstasy, he is nevertheless conscious of various auditions which are granted to him. The revelations to Rabbi Joseph Caro were of this type and largely preserved in his mystical diary, the Magid Mesharim. But Albotini reports an even higher state, beyond audition. This is a state of such utter bliss that the simplified soul simply dies for joy. According to our text and the tradition of Rekhanati, Ben Azai died in this exalted communion. We must be struck at the remarkable reinterpretation of the Talmud involved here. For according to the famous episode in Chagiga regarding the four who entered paradise, Ben Azai does not enter and leave in peace like Rabbi Akiva, but rather gazed and died. That is to say, he was overcome by the dangers of the ascent and vision. To be sure, Talmudic tradition also records our psalm verse, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his pious ones. But it, is hardly, but it hardly has the positive dimension ascribed to it by Al Botini. It also bears note that the noun used here for pious ones, chasidav, is far from innocent. According to an old rabbinic tradition found in the Mishnah, the chasidim, the pious ones, and the anshe ma'aseh, men of deeds, used to set their minds in meditation for an hour before prayers in the morning. In Rekhanati's aforementioned commentary on death by a kiss, he refers to this ancient notion and says that they were, quote, in solitude, engaged in high mysteries. It would thus seem that there was a developed tradition that Ben Azai died in a state of mystical trance, enthralled by the vision he had received. One can hardly doubt that a reinterpretation of the term on Shema Aser, men of deeds, contributed to this understanding. For by the medieval period, the noun ma'aseh, in, for example, the phrase Kabbalah ma'asit, did not mean deed, pure and simple, but mystical, magical praxis. The ancient anshe ma'aseh were thus transformed from men of good deeds to the rabbinic forerunners of practitioners of medieval meditational practice. Such are the intriguing byways of a living tradition. The meditative practices of the 16th, of 16th century Safed are most remarkably attested in the works of Rabbi Chaim Vital, the great disciple of the Holy Ari, Rabbi Isaac Luria. Of particular interest is his own special tract on ecstasy known as Sha'arei Kedusha. Here he develops the proper preparations before beginning the meditative process of isolation in mind and body, hit bodidut. Preparations which include repentance and proper performance of the law, as well as a highly refined sense of humility. The more insensate quality of equanimity is also mentioned. And various old traditions are mentioned in connection with this state of holy indifference to play, praise or blame. Vital places himself in the ecstatic tradition, both through the techniques of contemplation he describes and the writers he quotes. Rabbi Isaac of Akko and Rabbi Menachem Rekhanati are among the chain 
to which he links himself throughout the course of part four. Earlier in part three, Vital describes techniques and purifications for receiving the Holy Spirit of prophecy. In chapter three, he describes five purifications, the last of which begins as follows. The fifth purification is this, when he shall prepare himself to receive the Holy Spirit, and after all the good measures detailed earlier have been deeply impressed upon him, let him enter into a solitary dwelling with purity and holiness, a place where the sounds of humans or the chirping of birds cannot disturb him. The time after midnight is even more suitable for such matters. Then let him shut his eyes and simplify his thought from all matters pertaining to this world, as if his soul departed from him, as from a dead man who feels nothing. After this, he should try and strive with a great effort to think of the upper world and cleave there with the roots of his souls and with the supernal lights, and let him imagine to himself as if his soul departed and ascended on high, and let him make a configuration of the higher world as if he were standing in them. And if he achieved any unification, let him meditate on it and thereby draw light and the influx down throughout all the worlds. And let him also focus upon receiving his portion at the end of his meditation. Vital returns to this theme at the end of part four. It is there that he recites a chain of mystical tradition. In the succeeding chapter, he outlines the awesome mantra of the 72 names of God in all their mysterious vocables. It is followed by a second tradition mentioning this name for the purpose of receiving the Holy Spirit. In my humble opinion, he remarks, this is what is written in the work Chaye HaOlam Haba, but it is much abbreviated. Vital thus brings at the end a work of the giant of the beginnings of ecstatic Kabbalah, Rabbi Abraham Avolafia, though the citation actually comes from the Sefer HaCheshek. Let us return to Rekanati. I mention him again because we have been focusing on intellectual and meditational ecstasy, which occurs in isolation and through non-halachic or non-legal practices. I would therefore like to conclude with some remarks about mystical death in the fixed prayer of the community. Since I will be devoting much attention to this important and neglected topic in subsequent lectures, I will only mention here several texts which also echo our theme of killing oneself, a theme which has been something of a leitmotif this evening. Thus, in his comment on Parshat Vayikra at the beginning of the book of Leviticus, Rekanati interprets the verse from Leviticus, and if a soul will offer a sacrificial offering unto the Lord. He interprets this to mean that one must offer God his will by elevating it to the superior will of God. And through this act of self-negation, one will receive the fulfillment of the requests for which he offered his sacrifices. Rekanati's comment is full of paradox but it nevertheless makes clear that true prayer is fundamentally an act of self-emptying. This spiritualization of sacrifice as a form of mystical death in life is more forcefully articulated in the early generations of Hasidism, particularly in the following comment attributed to the Baal Shem Tov. In the Tzavaat Haribash, we read, Behold, I desire to kill myself in order to serve the name, be he be blessed, in truth and with a whole heart, in love and fear, that I acknowledge his unity fully. Therefore, I desire to kill myself, even to sacrifice myself as an offering before him. In this passage, the Baal Shem articulates his desire for continuous self-sacrifice before God a sacrifice of the self, or ego, for all the while that one's lower self is palpable, it creates a duality, so to speak, in the divine unity. 
Only utter self-negation can lead to a magnification of God's name. Spiritual union can come only with a sacrifice or killing of one's natural self, called here atmi, myself. With this language, we can thus perceive a bold reinterpretation of the Talmudic saying of the, ta of the scholars of the self, who 2,000 years earlier answered the query, what should one do in order to live? With the reply, yamit et atmo, let him kill himself or mortify himself. For the Baal Shem, death in prayer is a deep spiritual communion, the ultimate act of self-sacrifice. Therewith, the Talmudic teaching has been radically reinterpreted. A similarly profound rereading of this ancient rabbinic dictum is preserved as the, as the teaching of the Magid of Mezrich, the great disciple of the Baal Shem. The Magid's comment provides a fitting summary to our theme this evening. He begins with a Talmudic quote. Rabbi Barbarchana said, I shall show you the dead of the desert, referring to Numbers 14, and they were in a state of exhilaration. This matter pertains to what is also found in the Talmud. What should one do in order to live? He should kill himself. And what is found elsewhere, the Torah is not fulfilled except by one who kills himself for it. As it is said, this is the law when a man dies in his tent. And we must understand the meaning of death, mita, in this case. To explain himself, the great Magid first presents the analogy of a student who, after some difficulty, penetrates the teachings of his master and becomes so absorbed that he cannot respond to one who calls him. This profound absorption, says the Magid, quote, is almost like death or sleep, which is one sixtieth of death. In a similar way, does silent thought transcend speech. For when thought leaves the limitations of language, it enters into the world of thought, and the mind is enlarged. A yet higher and more profound case of this process can be seen in the course of verbal prayer, when the limitations of words and corporeal reality are temporarily transcended and there is an enlargement of consciousness in a state of silent bliss. And this, the Magid concludes, is the true meaning of, I shall show you the dead of the desert. Who, who, and for whoever kills himself, that is, who dies to himself, is one who dies to the words, dibure, the words of prayer. And as regards the phrase, and they were in a state of exhilaration, this means that they were enraptured because, of the great, because they greatly abandoned their attention on worldly verbal things, as in sleep. In this powerful discourse, the Magid puns on the Talmudic reference to the dead of the desert, Midbar, who were in a state of exhilaration, and sees it as an allusion to those who would die to their everyday language, Midibur in order to achieve the rapture of silent communion with God. This spiritual death transcends selfhood. It is a killing or mortification of oneself, atmo, in order to die in God. Attachment to speech and its worldly forms must therefore be transcended. This is what one must do in order to live. Let me conclude with a modern midrash on the transcendence of speech. I am referring to a meditation of Chaim Nachman Bialik, the poetic heir of Yehuda Halevi. Bialik's desire is, he says, to receive once again, if for one brief moment, the first sweetness of his childhood. He knows that, quote, the splendid vision is never granted twice. But he waits, nevertheless, like a tuned harp for that angelic gift of a world pure and unviolated with God's wonder on my face. And then it happens. By the silent pool of a wood, 
dripping shadow and light. Filled with its sacred desires, my heart trembles, expires, and dies. Uva ma'ave kodsho libi yachil yichla yigva. And the voice of the hiding God breaks the silence and asks, where are you? The poet has died to his former self and receives the revelation of God. And God teaches him purely in the, quote, silent, imminent language, in the shades of hues of the world, and in the sea's wrath, and in the roar of light. Looking into the pool, the poet beholds the eye of the forest prince, great in mysteries and in patient, profound meditation. Thus it was as foretold long ago. If you wish to live, then die. To be reborn with a heavenly vision, one must first transcend all things personal. Bialik thus concludes a long Jewish tradition which emphasized the love of God as a return to the realms of paradise. One must die somehow in order to pass the fiery sword that, guide, that guards the gates of Eden, the eternal realm of God. Or is that realm already here, before us, on earth, as Bialik hints? I leave the question open. Thank you.